and I'm an angel. Do you believe this? And she looked at me and says, no. <laughs> I thought, what was so quick about seeing this that convinced her that she was not in heaven? Well, you probably have the answer before you. Well, anyways, I enjoy the church family tremendously, so um, always a pleasure to see everyone. By the way, Cindy Bennett is actually at Rosewood right now, if you want to go see Cindy, who's been up in Maine and New Hampshire over the last uh, half a year to a year, so she's there as well if you'd like to see her. Catechism question for the month. Um, Flows from the last question um, in regards to the benefits that we have as those who have been drawn to Jesus Christ. And, and this is the first benefit or blessing, which is justification. So the question is, what is justification besides a big word? Well, justification is this. Justification is an act of God's free grace whereby he pardons all our sins. Now, we could stop right there and think, that's what salvation is. Yep, yep, I'm, sad. I'm forgiven, every one of them. That's right. But justification is more than that. Not only does he pardon all of our sins, but he accepts us as righteous in his sight, but only through the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith alone. It's more than just being forgiven. I've been given the gift of righteousness, Here's a question. Don't raise your hand. How many here are guilty and how many here are innocent? It's a trick question, by the way. In myself, I am guilty a thousand times upon a thousand times. But in Jesus, I am innocent. I'm innocent in Christ. Total gift from God. Let's read about that gift in Romans chapter 12, or chapter 5, verses 12 through 21. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. But until the law, sin was not in the world, or sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even though over those who did not sin in the likeness of the offense of Adam who is a type of him who is to come. But the free gift is not like the transgression. For the transgression of the one, the many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions, resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one much more. Those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification to life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is the word of God for this morning. Let's pray for understanding. God, help us to grasp the joy of knowing you, Lord Jesus, as our gift of righteousness, that we in you stand innocent in your sight. Thank you for the gift. Now instruct us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is a very strange thing that Paul does in Corinthians where Paul says that Jesus is the second Adam or the second man. We had the first Adam, and we have the second Adam. And I guess the first thing I would say is this, that Paul seems to believe that Adam was a real historical individual. He wasn't just some made-up myth or purely legend. He was really an historic person. Because here, he contrasts and compares Adam with Jesus. If Adam's going to be a mythological person, well, I guess then Jesus would have to be too. No, Paul sees him as an historical person, Adam. He's a type of the one who is to come. But my question is this. What about Adam is like Jesus? 
Is there any comparison? Because he says that Adam is a, is, 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 a, is a type of him, Jesus, who was to come. So where's the connection? Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about all the contrast. Adam. Adam brings death. Christ brings life. Adam was disobedient, and Jesus was purely obedient. Adam was made from the dust of the ground and breathed into the Spirit while Christ was fashioned in the womb by the Spirit. So what is the, what, what is the connection here between Adam and Jesus? Don't you feel the tension this morning? You're like, I don't know. Maybe someone will tell us. Well, the answer, I think, is right here in our verse is that Adam was a type of him who was to come. And what the answer is is simply this, that the people that Adam represented, they were affected by his behavior. The one transgression all died. The ones that Jesus represents, they will live forever. It's called the imputation of Christ's federal headship to our account. His work hammered out in the flesh is given to us so in Christ Jesus, we're innocent even though we're guilty a thousand times upon a thousand times. We stand innocent in his sight. But if we're in Adam, which all men are born in Adam, we are guilty because of what Adam did, and we rebel, don't we? I don't like that. I wasn't in the garden. It wasn't my fault. If I was in the garden, I wouldn't have sinned. I would have been better than Adam. This isn't fair. I don't like this. I don't like being considered a sinner because of what Adam did. Well, let's not pretend this morning that you haven't willfully, joyfully joined in the rebellion of your own self-worship. Because you have. So don't be claiming some kind of innocence before God. We're all guilty, and the reason why we're all guilty is because of what Adam did. You have to kind of put yourself in a courtroom sense here, where there's verdicts, there's testimony, and there's evidence. And that's sort of what Paul's been arguing. He's a, he's a lawyer. And these words are sort of like the courtroom scene. Now, we rebel against that sort of kind of imputation of Adam's sin to us. And I guess I can understand some of that. Let me go back to my childhood. When I was in third and fourth grade, I was really good at recess. I think at recess I got an A+. Plus. Best grade, recess. Too bad it didn't appear on the report card. That might have helped the, uh, the grounding by my parents if that would have been on there, but it wasn't. And... If we, got, if we had our recess cut short because of the behavior of a few, I mean, I was mad. I mean, I was ticked off in my little third grade body. I was upset. The whole world needed to hear of this in great injustice. What? We've lost recess time because of clown number one and clown number two? Why should I be punished for their misbehavior? But on the other hand, when our recess was extended because of the good behavior of a few, you didn't hear me rebelling, did you? I didn't look at the clock and say, well, I'm going in because it's time to get in for recess. I'm going to sit at my desk. Are you kidding me? I enjoyed the extra 15 minutes, and I didn't complain a bit. It's funny how things change when we look at imputation and we think, I'm not, I don't want to be guilty because of what Adam did. Well, I'm never going to complain that my righteousness is in heaven secured in the person of Christ Jesus. Because this morning, if you're a Christian, and you've embraced Christ as your God, your Savior, your Lord, and you've realized your undoneness before him, if you've come to him, you're innocent before him. Even though you're guilty a thousand times, a thousand times, a thousand times, a thousand. You're innocent in him. But if you're still an Adam, because you haven't come to Christ, you're still guilty before him. Guilt in Adam, innocence in Christ. And Paul is trying to show us in these verses that if all that was true in Adam, how much more will Christ's federal headship bless those who are in him? Paul has been talking about the great gospel of God, God's message to, to reclaim humanity, his lifeline to sinful people if they will just embrace the righteousness that is in Jesus and not their own. Because faith is saying this, I'm not trusting in my own good behavior. In fact, I don't want my good behavior. I'm throwing my good behavior out. I want the perfect behavior of Jesus to be mine. And that's the gospel. Paul says this is the gospel of God, understanding what justification is, that his 
Righteousness is imputed to my account. The doctrine this morning is this. Jesus represents those who receive him by faith alone. Faith alone. Not faith plus your good works. I really tried hard to use my alliteration this this week, so legal lover's language, point one. Don't you like that? All those L's. It's a courtroom scene, these verses. There's verdicts. There's evidence given. There's condemnation, and there's innocence offered. Imputation defined as simply this, that, you know, the behavior or results of someone else's actions are given to my account. That's just what the word means. And here in this context, it says, let's go verse by verse here. It goes 12, word by word through verses 12 through 14. Paul says in verse 12, just as through one, one man, who's the one man? Adam. Through one man, sin entered into the world and death through sin. So death spread to who? All men. Because why? All sinned. When? In Adam. He's the type of the one to come. For until the law, there's a lawyer's word, the law, sin was definitely in the world. Read Genesis chapter 1 all the way to the end of the, the, um, the book and you'll find sin everywhere. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Hmm. So why did they all die? Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offensive Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. They still died, didn't they? From Adam to Moses, everybody died. Everywhere they died. There wasn't a place that they didn't die. Everyone died. Even Enoch was taken from his existence. Why? Because there must have been a law. Sin must have been imputed to their account. Therefore, they died. Now, we look at our world, and that fits our reality, does it? Does anybody here know where the island of eternal life is in this, on this planet? Have you ever visited? Has anybody here found the, the fountain of youth? I'm looking around the room and saying, probably not. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> I haven't found it either. That's why Nancy realized she was not in heaven. We haven't found it. This explains something. It explains why death reigns, that apologetical question. Why does everybody have to say goodbye? We don't want to say goodbye. But we do. It happens every day, over and over and over again, on this little third rock from the sun called Earth. Why? Why does something so precious as life that we fight for, why does it end? And there's your answer. Because sin has been imputed to us because of what Adam has done. In a legal courtroom setting, that's what we would hear. We are guilty in Adam, but in Christ we are innocent. Death reigned because of Adam. So why did they die? Because they did, even though there wasn't a law like the one that Adam had was because Adam represented a people. How many, don't raise your hand, but how many here want Adam to represent them as your defense lawyer before the throne room of God? No, I'm going to choose Adam. I'm not going to choose Adam. I'm I'm going to choose the second Adam, who was Christ, because Adam was a, a type of him who was to come. Adam represented a people, all humanity. Christ represents all those who are of faith. Do you have faith this morning in him? Faith alone to receive, to receive the gift of rightness with God. Because Paul has told us in Romans that the wrath of God has been revealed against all unrighteousness. And I need righteousness then. And if no one is righteous, not even one, where am I going to find this gift? Well, it's found in Christ. So now, Christian, without raising your hand... Answer the question, are you guilty or are you innocent? I'm innocent in Jesus. I am declared innocent in his sight. Paul says, even those who died who didn't sin in the likeness of Adam, who didn't sin in regard to a commandment that had a death sentence attached to it. The only death that we know of is uh, if you eat of the tree, you're going to die. But from Adam to Moses, there was no written law that we know of or a verbal law that said, if you do these things, you're going to die. Sin was still in the world, but they didn't sin in the likeness of Adam. You can prove these things by simply the sad fact of a a six-month-old baby dying and leaving the world. Why? They haven't willfully chosen against a revealed written word 
but they still die, don't they? Because the fact is that Adam represented a people. And not only positionally do they have guilt, but that guilt then is lived out in this world and we see death reigning. But how much more is it true of Jesus? That those who believe in Christ through faith alone, that they will reign with him forever. You know when we baptize people? You know we put them under the water? We really do. And, and some people might need to be held there a little longer than others, but we won't give, mention people's names. But there's a point, there's a picture that's being expressed, a spiritual reality. And I tell my baptismal candidates, this is what you're picturing. When you go under the water, you're picturing your death with Christ, that you had union with him. As Paul would say, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live but not I, but Christ lives in me. We go under the water. We died with Christ. But then when we come out of the water, it's a picture of our being raised to newness of life, that I have life in Christ. My mortal body will fail, but I will live forever. I will be raised in the likeness of Christ's resurrection. And it'll show in my life here and now. Paul says, how much more? If this was true of Adam, how much more through the gift of righteousness will this be true of those who are in Christ. How about, secondly, Paul's practical proofs? Imputation, the word's used twice in the New Testament in its form here. It's used in Philemon, verse 18. You know the book of Philemon, right? It's a real short little tiny thing in the New Testament, tucked away you know, right before the book of Revelation there, before the other epistles. Philemon is a letter written by Paul to Philemon, about a slave or servant that has run away from, from Philemon, whose name is Onesimus. And Onesimus has become a Christian under Paul's tutelage, but he's still a servant of Philemon, legally speaking. And Paul says this to Philemon, Listen, you've suffered loss. You've suffered loss because Onesimus has run away. I want you to take what you've lost, and I want you to charge it or impute it to my account. I will take care of it. It will be my error. His bad behavior will be on my account, and I will pay for it. That's the word imputation. That's been imputed to us, the sin of Adam. But the righteousness of Christ, which is a gift, is also imputed to the account of people who will believe, who will trust in the goodness of Christ Jesus the Lord. We want to rebel against the Adam thing, don't we? I don't, I don't want to be imputed with his sin. I wasn't there, but you weren't there at the cross either, were you? No, I don't remember seeing you the suffering there. I don't remember seeing you say, taking the lashes for sin. I don't remember you seeing and hearing the words. You know, he, he, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? I wasn't there either. But all of that is imputed to my account, that gift of righteousness. I'll give you another illustration. I hope this helps. We... Uh, it was my freshman year in college. We were coming back from Christmas break. Uh, we were in basketball practice. We were going to go to play in a tournament in Miami against Miami Christian, Atlanta Christian, and Valley Forge in Pennsylvania. And our coach wanted to make sure we didn't get fat and flabby over the Christmas break. So we were running suicides. And boy, we were running suicides. I don't think the basketballs were brought up that practice. We were just running and running and running. One of the players was running so hard, given 120%, that the coach blew the whistle and said, that's enough. Because David is running so hard, I'm going to end practice right now. Hit the showers. No one said, well, coach, thanks for the gift, but I'm going to keep running suicides until we're done here. Are you kidding me? We were all blessed because of the behavior of the one. That's the gift of righteousness. The gift of Christ who hammered out in his flesh a perfect life, perfectly loving his Father. Every moment of every second of every day, he loved his Father. Even when hanging on the cross and God the Father placing the sins of his people upon his shoulders, the law said, love your Father still. Even when they were yelling at him, save yourself, save, you saved others. He said, love your Father. Don't flinch one inch, Jesus. And he didn't. He loved his father perfectly. And that gift is given to you by faith, if you'll believe. Imagine that. You can be innocent before God, even though you're guilty a thousand times a thousand, and still will be. But you'll be innocent in his sight. The gift of righteousness. 
You know, it's hard because right now in theological circles, um, a man named Gundry is saying, we need to be rid of Christ's righteousness imputed to sinners. That needs to be abandoned. Abandoned. Well, that's, that's pretty strong language. You know, Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 9, he uses this language, may I be found in him. May I personally be found in him, Christ, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. Well, well if, if I'm not going to have a righteousness derived from my behavior, then where do I get it? Don't I get it from being good and churchy and wearing the right clothes and being nice and having nice hair? No. But for what which that comes through faith in Christ Jesus, the righteousness which comes by from God on the basis of what? Faith. That's how I gain it. John Piper, he's reading um, the Bible to his daughter, Tabitha, who at this time was six years old. And they're having devotions as a family. And they just finished reading the book of Acts. And so Tabitha says, let's read Romans. <laughs> six years old. Okay, we can read Romans. And so word by word, they look at every word, and John reads very slow and captures every word as they're reading along. We come to the word justification. And so Tabitha says, stop. Dad, what's justification mean? Well, John has several options on the table, doesn't he? Oh, don't worry. That's just a big word that no one understands. Or you could say, well, when you get older, you'll get what that word under means. Or you could say, don't worry about that. It's not important. John says, or you could tell a story. So John tells a story to little Tabitha, six years old, having devotions. There was these two people who were both charged with criminal activity, he says, and they were standing before a judge. And the one criminal really hadn't done anything wrong. He was innocent, and so the judge let him off because all the testimony was that this man was innocent, and so he was let go. And Tabitha's like, okay, that makes sense. Then there was another person who came before the judge, the second man, and he was guilty. I mean, he was guilty, 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 guilty. Everyone gave evidence that, testimony, that this man was guilty. There was no question. And the judge says, I declare you innocent too. You are free of the charges. You can go out throughout my land and you have all the freedoms and all the rights of everyone in our, in our country. And Tabitha's like, huh? There's something wrong with that. She borrows her frow brow and, you know, that's strange. And so dad says to her, John says to her, why do you think that could happen? And she goes, I know it has something to do with Jesus. Because Jesus is always the answer when you're six years old, right? That's the, that's the answer to all questions, Jesus. And so John begins to tell her, it's because Jesus lived out the perfect life. That if you believe, Tabitha, you too also can be right, even though you're criminally guilty. And just because John knew the doctrine of imputation, he could then tell her that Jesus' perfect goodness is placed upon your account. And you can be innocent before God, though you are guilty a thousand times a thousand. Who do you want to be your defense lawyer, my friend? Adam or Jesus? If you don't have Jesus, Adam is your defense lawyer, okay? If you haven't embraced Christ, Adam is still your defense attorney. And what does he impute? Death spread to all men. Because all sinned. When? They sinned in Adam. But I wasn't there. It doesn't matter. I wasn't at the cross either. And yet I'm given the gift of righteousness because of uh, God's great goodness to us who will believe. Finally, the last point is simply this. Jesus just justifies. What's the nature of this verdict that we have? Well, it's declarative. It's not God infusing goodness into me. That's something else. That's the rebirth. That's sanctification. Justification is a legal courtroom declarative term. I am righteous in his sight, and the verdict comes down. It's simply a declaration, a statement about who I am in Jesus. Wonderful thought. It doesn't change. I'm always secure in Jesus if Jesus is truly mine. Now, this became a real hot topic during the Reformation. The Roman Catholic Church would say this. It would say that we are saved by grace. That's good, right? We're saved by grace through Christ's righteousness. That's true. But what do they mean by that? They mean this, that we're saved by Christ's righteousness being worked through my behavior. In other words, it's not Christ's 
personal righteousness that saves me. It's me working out that righteousness in this life. Is there any security in that? Because I don't work it out really all that great sometimes. Just ask Nancy as I was bugging her at the bedside that day. I mean, I don't. And so the nature of this verdict is it's a declaration about who I am. I'm declared righteous. That's the definition of justification. I can remember my first traffic ticket. I'll use that as an illustration. Churning down Pennsylvania Interstate 80 with a bunch of students in the back of the van going to a Christian college for a college day. You know what? We're chugging around. There's no one, there's no one anywhere. But we're in the middle of nowhere Pennsylvania. There's no deer on the road. There's no one. And I'm just, we're playing cards while I'm driving, which is not a smart thing, I understand. But, you know, we're passing cards back and forth, playing games. And all of a sudden, I look down the speedometer. Oh, I'm going 69, 70. And as soon as I looked down, guess who I saw? It wasn't a deer. It was one of those guys with the lights on top of the car, right? <laughs> and uh, sure enough, he turns around and pulls me over, and, and I get a ticket, which I deserved. But at that moment, when he gave me the ticket, was he making me a bad driver? No, he's simply declaring that at that moment, I was not driving like a... He's just making a declaration about my driving skill at that moment, at that time. And that's why there's a date and a time on the ticket. It was this time of day, at this date. You, he wasn't making me a bad driver. He's de- that's the nature of the verdict here. He's not making me righteous. I will become righteous one day. That's a different term. He declares me to be so in his sight, so I have freedom to, to, to come to him in prayer. And when I, when, I, when, I, when I fail during the week, I, I can still come. I come humbly. I come confessing, but I'm still his. Never, never, ever to lose it. So the duration of this, this verdict, it's, it's permanent. I, I don't lose it. The gavel comes down. There's no, there's no doctrine of, of being unimputed or being un, undeclared righteous. This isn't there. I know people come to Jesus sometimes, or we think they come, and then they walk away, but that's really a sign that they never really believed. They just never really embraced the truth. There's a million reasons why people try to be religious for a short season, and I can't go into all of them today, but this this declaration is a courtroom declaration about who we are. If Adam is a type of him who is to come, how much more is the reality of Christ's righteousness given to us? in this world today. Um, it's a permanent standing. And by the way, it can't be a process. It can't be us being declared righteous if we finally live up to a certain standard. God's not holding out on us. Or the verses in, in Romans can't be true. The past. Therefore, having been, past tense, aorist, been justified by faith, I've got peace with God. I just have it. Or how about presently? For there is now, presently, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Right this second, you're in Christ. there's no condemnation. It's all gone. In the future, there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. In the future, which is found in Christ Jesus, it's, it's permanent. It's not a process. God cannot enter into and intermingle with a relationship with people who are still in process. There's going to be something about us that's right in His sight that reflects His holiness, and that's the imputation of Christ's righteousness to our account, that gift of righteousness. So when do I receive this in time and space? He received it on the, on the occasion of faith. Faith. You believe. Like a beggar receiving a piece of bread, you just receive it. Your faith is not the righteousness. Your faith is just the instrument grabbing onto the gift of righteousness. As Gundry says, he says the faith is the righteous. God considers the faith righteousness. That's not true. Faith is just the gift that embraces the righteousness offered to us. So I guess I'm just going to ask you today, with one last story, to kind of maybe make it clearer. Who's your defense lawyer before the barroom of God? Adam? The first Adam or the second Adam? I'm going to go with the second Adam, Jesus. How much more will his righteousness imputed to my account stand before him and I'll always be righteous in his sight, though I am guilty a thousand times over? That's the blessing of Christianity. Let me just tell you one story of what faith might look like. One of my early adventures to Juarez, Mexico, to that drug lord infested city where death sometimes seems to reign more than other places. 
uh, it was back in the ni- early 90s, I think it was 92, 93, I brought one of my youth ministry groups, my discipleship kids, to Juarez to build houses. And we had finished building a house, and we were back on the El Paso side. We had one more night, so we decided they were going to cross back on Juarez through the, the walking bridge where you can walk from El Paso into, into, into Mexico. You have to have all your, your documentation with you and stuff. Um, and so we crossed over. It wasn't the, probably the best idea because as soon as you cross over into uh, Mexico, you're offered all kinds of things that you really don't want to partake of, some very gross, by the way. And so we spent some time just shopping around, looking around, staying as a group of kids together with the, with the adult chaperones. And then as we were going back into El Paso, crossing over the, the walk bridge on the Mexico side, there were three little children. I think there was three. Maybe there was four. I can't remember in my, my mind. But there were three little children, maybe four years old, five years old, and maybe a two-year-old sitting there. No, no adults around anywhere. Just sitting next to the fence with their hand out. Mom was in diapers. So I had, some, I had some Mexican currency with me. And I just sat down, and a little bit of Spanish I, I knew. I talked about Jesus Christos and, and God bless you, bendiga. And, and I handed it to them. Here's, and all I had to do was take it. Nothing in them earned them that money. In fact, them reaching out wasn't the money itself, was it? That was just the means to grasp onto the money. It was only because, really, I, we had pity on them, as God really has mercy upon sinners. All you've got to do is take it, my friend. you just got to take it and believe with all your heart that he loves you as you are, not as you should be. But he's not going to leave you as you are because he loves you. He's going to work in you a work of life that will transform you because he's